Thank you, Elena, for sharing, sharing your experiences with us today. So we're going to skip our short break, um, and we're going to continue with our next speaker, who is Mr. Wissam Sharufuddin. Um, he will bring us back to our key words for the day, secular values, Islam. So those are our key words. Uh, Wissam? So I'm just going to give you a brief overview of who this awesome man is. Um, a few key things. He has um, his long history of studying Islam. He is Lebanese American. He is a co-founder of Muslimish, so he's really important, um, especially here today. He uh, he is he works in the fields of educational administration. He is an entrepreneur and founder and CEO of W Design and Development, W Institute, and Dearborn Blog. In his free time, he enjoys sailing, poetry, reading, music, and traveling with his children. I'll keep reading. Um, so he immigrated here after, with his family after the first Gulf War. He became an American citizen in 2004. He completed his associate's degree in fine arts and liberal studies from Henry Ford Community College. He has a bachelor's in electrical and computer engineering from Wayne State, and a master's in software engineering from the University of Michigan, Dearborn. During his academic studies, Wissam continued to study and give lectures on Islamic Sharia through distance study programs with Hausa of Ahl Bayt in Qom, Iran, and with local scholars. He was the founder of Hal Halakat Imam al Bakr, an Islamic Studies Institute in Dearborn, where he taught, among other teachers, on various topics in Islamic studies. He was a co-founder of the Muslim Scouts of Michigan, Islamic Monitor Action Network, Islamic Unity Magazine, and was a member of various organizations, among which were the Council of American Islamic Relations, Islamic House of Wisdom, and Amnesty International. Wissam co-founded Irshad, the Institute for Religious Studies, Humanities, and Dialogue in 2005. Irshad is an organization that seeks free coexistence between human beings and the, the aspiration for building a better life centered around the well-being of humanity. Irshad functions in its Islamic branch as a reform movement that calls for freedom of belief and expression and a less literal interpretation of the Quran. In 2008 to 2009, while researching to write an article about Islam and evolution, he found an, a new understanding of science and adapted a new understanding of life based on that. So let's hear from our co-founder, Sam. Hello, everyone. Thank you for being here. Um, this is definitely a considered a historical moment and a beginning of a very important conversation. I don't claim that this is the first time this conversation is open. Actually, my presentation is going to show that this conversation is hundreds of years old. But uh, at least it's an emphasis on the continuation of this conversation and of including, or this conversation should have, uh, should participate in setting up the agenda for uh, Muslim. Uh, as a community. Uh, like we have heard from many of our speakers that uh, Islam and uh, a person's religion intermixes with their identity, with, the, with culture, and it would be very hard to uh, split them apart. We continually grow in our understanding of life and our philosophy continues to uh, to grow and, and be nurtured by our experiences, nevertheless, we uh, cannot really uh, uh, say that we have left any of these integral parts of our, uh, of our identity, uh, especially cultural ones that are that's tied to our memories and our emotions and feelings. Uh, and we should reject in a time uh, that is very important to do so, reject those who um, claim that uh, you are not qualified to be this or that. Uh, we, we need to participate in the conversation and not let the conversation be hijacked by uh, those who uh, 
claim the monopoly over it. So, uh, preceding today's talk is going to be secular values of Islam. You might be surprised, you might think of it as an oxymoron. Uh, how can there be a secular values in Islam? And Islam claims it is a total thinking, a total religious way of life. So, okay. In an interview in 2008 with Saudi anthropologist Saad uh, Swayan, he demonstrated that secularism is not only good for Islam, but also is actually consistent with original uh, spirit. He actually went so far as claiming that Prophet Muhammad is secular. He's a thinker from Saudi Arabia. So how can a person claim such a thing? Is there enough content and context within Islam that have, that have so much secular values as to uh, support such a claim. I don't make the same claim, but I'll go over some of the values uh, of secularism that are in Islam. Uh, first of all, we have to define secularism, and I'm assuming that the, the, the definition of secularism is the principle of the separation of the state from religious institutions. Those who tend to uh, claim that secularism uh, does not allow religion to play any part of civil affairs. I don't accept that definition. I think secularism, like one of our speakers said, that it insists on uh, all to participate in the democratic process and in shaping our culture and society. Uh, and uh, the definition that, in, that considers secularism a rejection of all forms of religion I don't also, uh, I'm not uh, assuming that this is the definition of secularism here. I'm assuming it's uh, basically a separation between state and, uh, and, and religion. So I'm going to discuss 10 uh, secular values in Islam. You might have, uh, you can, you, can uh, you know, find more than that. Uh, first of all, there is no foundation of governance in Islam. And that is one of the main concepts of secular values in Islam. That the, uh, the Qur'an, there is no establishment of any system of governance in the Qur'an. The uh, situation after the death of the imagine a prophet who was so precise about teaching all kinds of manners of life. There's 24 tradition on miswak, on brushing teeth. But there isn't one on the system of governance that is after him. And that is, of course, one of the main reasons for the big split among the two main sects in Islam, which are Shia and Sunnah, is the claim, both of them claim, that there was a system of governance left, kind of indirectly. The Sunnis claim that it was the Shura system, the democratic system. It's not really democratic in our own definition. It's basically a select group of, of of people, the closest group to the Prophet, uh, they used to be called Ahl al-Halli wal a very elite, a small group that are the closest to the Prophet, they make a decision on something and that is the, and that's what becomes the, the rule of land. That was the Sunni the theory, and the Shia theory is that there was so much emphasis of the Prophet on his cousin, Imam Ali Ali ibn Abi Talib, that it is actually was by appointment, that the uh, leadership, the uh, governance of Islam is by appointment. Two different theories, and uh, they both share the same sources, the same holy book, and something as major as that, I mean, if you can think about it, I mean, I mentor student governments in schools, and one of the very basic things that, you know, a president has a vice president. And every class has a president, and every class has a vice president. Sixth graders in every class, they have a president, and they have a vice president. And if the vice president is, is left or transferred to another school, then the president appoints another vice president, immediately. Because you cannot have a sixth grade class with a president without a vice president. What if the president is absent? Who do we talk to? 
There is a meeting and we need the president and he's not there. What do we do? And something as basic as that, and there are no traditions setting any vice presidency, setting any type of wizara, setting any type of um, uh, khilafa, succession. Now, definitely I, I, the, the, the Shia voice will come very strongly that yes, he did. But if you go over, and there's a book that discusses this in, in details, Kitab al murajaat which is a discussion between the Imam of Azhar and the Imam of the Shia at that time. And the discussion is about the subject. And after the narration of over oh, traditions and traditions and traditions by the Shia Imam explaining all the great emphasis of the Prophet on the value and status of his cousin, Ali ibn Abi Talib, uh, the Imam of Azhar told him, listen, we agree on all these traditions. Actually, we have more traditions about the same context than these. We have more, I can bring you more traditions than that. But we believe that all these narrations, the language used in them, none that appoints a leader after the Prophet, none appoints a Khalifa. It's all an emphasis. It is a nomination of such a leadership and it's not an appointment. Listen, the Arabic language does not lack clarity. The Arab, if, if I want to appoint someone here, I'll make it clear to my audience that this person is the appointed person. After I die, this person becomes the leader. You come back to him for uh, for uh, court, you know, for law. You come back to him for leadership. He makes decisions on everything. It's, it's not a hard thing to establish. And yet, both Shia and Sunnah claim, no, 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 if he for sure appointed the system, and the fight continues because of the ambiguity of that situation. I understand, among many Muslims, understand that actually the Prophet did not leave a system intentionally. A person so precise that he told you how to enter a bathroom, to use your right foot entering a bathroom, and to use your left foot exiting out of a bathroom, and all the Muslims, you know, have that message clear. There is nobody that tells you you enter the bathroom with your left foot. But when it comes to the succession, something that is eternally, he claimed that he is the final of the prophets. The most important subject after that is who's your successor? And there is no clarity about that. And I claim that among many Muslims, there was no system of governance. He had no intention to establish a, a state that will you know, be uh, guided with his orders after him. And this is, of course it was politicized. This is, this is, we have been ruled by the theories of governance from that day in the, in the, in the year of 11th of Hijrah till the fall of the Ottoman Empire. Actually, some uh, states still claim that is a continuation of that theory, like Saudi Arabia, and others who claim that they, they ruled by the name of God. So. Uh, so, you know, you're talking about hundreds of years of governance that has emphasized, you know, the, the, the governance theory in Islam because it forced, of course, it fits their narrative. But there wasn't. And there was uh, chaos before even the burial of the Prophet. The Ansar met, uh, the people of Medina met, they took claim, you know, their, their theory. Omar had a theory. Uh, uh, Ali had a theory, and division has accrued from there. And there was kind of an improvisation after it, right? After the death of Abu Bakr, he did an appointment. When Omar died, he made like a system. He put six people, said six people have to vote within three days, kind of like the, the Catholic uh, selecting a pope uh, thing without the smoke. And the Uthman, uh, you know, Uthman didn't have a chance, and he did not have a successor because. You know, they did not establish a theory for that, so he was killed all of a sudden, and there was an absence. And Imam Ali used Imam Ali used uh, the theory of Omar, which is Ahl al-Hal al -Aqad. So they, you know, they, he, he said, "Laqad bayyahi Imam Bayyahu Bakr Omar." You know, they, the people who, who have established the Khilafah of Abu Bakr and Omar, they have agreed on me, so I am the legitimate Khalifa. So he, he used that theory. To, uh, to claim leadership, and then after him he appointed his son, 
while Muawiyah claimed that the division happened, the Umayyads took over and it became an inheritance until the Ottoman, the last day of the Ottoman Empire. Uh, no governance, the, system, the Muslims, of course, they, st they struggled. There is a uh, Dr. Ali Abdel Razak, one of the big shuf of Azhar, he wrote the book Islam and the Foundation of Governance in 1925. He was kicked out of Azhar because he claimed there is no system of governance in Islam. The government in Egypt at that time liked what he said, so they kind of did something opposite to what the Azhar did, and they appointed him as the Minister of Endowments, Wazir al-Khaf, for, for two terms. And then at a certain point in Azhar, they kind of retracted and they appointed him back in the Azhar. He wrote in Islam wa Usul al-Hukum. He was one of the big names in, in, in Islam Sharia who established that there was no system of governance in Islam. He also attended Oxford University. Past rulers, this is a quote from him, spread the notion of religious justification for the Khilafah so that they could use religion as a shield protecting their thrones against the attacks of the rebels. In recent uh, history, Imam Khomeini, he has established the theory of Wilayat al-Faqih based on very uh, non-famous hadiths that are especially Shia hadith, uh, hadith specifically from Imam al-Askari. He used that hadith to establish the theory of Wilayat al-Faqih. He was in exile. Uh, from Iran to Najaf at that time to Iraq. During 17 years, he taught uh, that theory and he established the basis of it and he published a very small booklet uh, about it. And it became the theory that governed Iran after the, the uh, success of the Islamic Revolution till our day to day. That was also a theory that was, you know, it was a newly developed theory actually, not even there is no consensus on it, not even among the elite scholars in Iran itself. Among the companions and friends of Imam Khomeini, there is no consensus on it. It's a theory that is uh, not very well established. And some claim that it, it is having its last breaths uh, with the uh, uh, aging of uh, Sayyid Khamenei, the current Wali al-Faqih after Imam Khomeini was the supreme leader in, uh, in Iran. So there is no system of governance in Islam. So uh, that is something that is relieving, and that is a secular principle itself. So how are you governing yourself? We know that you have to govern yourselves. We know that Allah Allah fi nadhmi amrikum, you have to organize. We know that that is an, an Islamic, you know, logical necessity. So, and then we don't have any scripture to support how do we govern and how we do it. It is we decide how we do it. And that's exactly the concept of secular, as it's exactly a secular value that you will decide what is the best governance system for you. A second value is, uh, I'm definitely the most needing of this, by the way. <laughs> Positive depiction for a non-Islamic rule in the Quran. Second of all, in the, in the Quran and in other hadith, the depiction of non-Islamic rule is not depicted negatively. In the famous story of Prophet Yusuf, who eventually uh, worked for the king of Egypt, and the king of Egypt was not a Muslim, but there's some, some claim to protect themselves from that, that theory. Some claim that he was a Muslim with no evidence, but he was not Muslim at that time. <clears throat> and he became uh, the minister, the minister of finance, it seems, for the king of Egypt. So a prophet worked in a government of a non-Islamic government. A prophet cannot work in a government that is an, 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 an uh, evil uh, kingdom. So uh, uh, the non-Islamic rule can be uh, not a bad rule. It can be something that is acceptable Islamically. At the early days of uh, Islam, when Muslims were prosecuted in Mecca, the Prophet ordered them to migrate to Abyssinia, Habasha. Why? Because there was a Christian just king over there. He said, in لَوْ خَرَشْتُ مِنَ الْحَبَشَ فَإِنَّا بِهَا مَلِكًا لَا يُطْلَمُ عَنْدَهُ أَحَدٍ Why don't you go to Abyssinia for there is a king there that no one will get oppressed under. It was a great testimony for that king. And they went and the Muslims lived there for years and they had children. They went 17, I think they came back 86 after uh, Medina uh, was established. 
So um, that is another, it is a testimony, it's a positive testimony of the Prophet, not say anything negative uh, about the king of Abyssinia. Queen Sheba, described in the Quran as a wise queen in, uh, in Yemen. And then Dhul Qarnayn, there is a, a you know, the, in Surah Al Kahf that he. فَلَمَّا بَلَغَ الْمَغْرِبَ الشَّمْسِ وَجَدَهَا تَغْرُبُ عَلَى قَوْمٍ لَمْ نَجْعَلْ لَهُمْ مِنْ دُونِهَا سِتْرَةً ثُمَّ أَتْبَعَ سَبَبًا we, When he reached the rising of the sun, he found it's rising over people for whom we had provided no covering protection against the sun as they were, we completely understood that was before him. He left them as they were. In the, in the previous verses, he was reaching people, they have a problem, he would solve the problem or do something about it and then he would move on. He reached these people and then he just moved on. The Islam, the Quran didn't say that he did anything. Which means, we have something example, the Iqrar. If a person of that status, a holy person, sees something evil and does not do anything, this means he accepts that as it is not evil or he, he you know, that's kind of an acceptance. Um, it is as strong as saying that it is a good thing. It's as strong as ordering people to do it. It's the same strength. So, uh, it, so the, he passed by people who were nudists. The Quran describes it very sensitively, the people who had no cover against the sun. So he basically passed by people who were nudists and there was no problem. There was, they had no social problem. So he just passed on. That wasn't a problem in itself, which means that people can establish. Uh, oh, you're gonna have so much hard time with me today. <laughs> you don't know what you're. <laughs> you don't know what you're walking into. Okay, Rashid, Rashid Ramushi, recently, and he's been in the news recently, right? He's been a hero in Tunis, Tunisia. He's the one who allowed for the marriage of Tunisian women to none. Uh, he's participated in that decision making to non-Muslim uh, men. Uh, are you pulling me now? No. <laughs> so, uh, can he, uh, he also was a, a big critic and a, a voice of secularism. And as I, as I researched for this presentation, I was shocked with the amount of secular thought, secular messages in our Islamic history. Like, I thought that is a talk by itself. From Abdurrahman al-Kawakibi to Sheikh Muhammad Abdu, to uh, Qasim, I mean, I mean, Sheikh Muhammad Abdul is Sheikh Al-Azhar, one of the big scholars of Azhar, about what, 150 years ago? And he, and he was exiled to, to Paris, and he established a very active uh, person, him and Sayyid Jamal al-Din al-Ghani. <coughs> they had a theory for secular, uh, secular values in Islam. They had the, the theory of separation between church and state. They had all this established at that time, at an individual level, and it died out. So I was wondering, all, this, all these movements that have stirred before, and they have died out, uh, it seems that it is a rebirth of this movement on and on again. And I feel now that we're going to reach a point where we're looking in their books, we're reviving these writings, if we can find them still, and bring them back to, uh, bring them back to life. If I had time, I would do that. I'm sure that uh, Muslims are going to go back to these people who've planted seeds, but that it wasn't right for their time. Coming back, thank you. We got an extension. All right. So, um, I'm sorry about that. I'm going to go really fast. It's a free market and deregulation in Islamic financial jurisprudence. There is really a sort of free market in Islam. Leave people, let them get their bounties you know, from each other. This kind of a deregulation. It's just the general, general rules, the forbidden of monopoly, of fraud, of usury, excessive interest, market manipulation, unrealistic stipulation, and analytical investments. It's general rules, but then there is some sort of a deregulation. There aren't much interference in the Islamic financial transactions, which is another strong point for establishing uh, a secular separation between church and state. Rules follow customs, al-ahkam tatba' al-a'raf. So many of the rules in Islam basically refers back to customs. It, it, it gives the ruling in general, and then it, it leaves people to figure out that according to their customs. Actually, the understanding of the Qur'an itself is referred back to customs. When God says, for example, 
uh, you know, wash your, when, when you hear the uh, call for prayer, go wash your faces. And you ask an Islamic jurist, what does wash your face mean? What does it technically mean? Can you describe to us what does washing the face mean? The answer is, whatever society considers washing of a face. That's the answer. And it goes further to, to many aspects of Islamic jurisprudence. When we say nafaqa, when uh, Islamic jurists say that the husband has to spend on his wife, and you ask him, what is that? What is t what's the tangible amount of that? He says, whatever the society agrees on. So refers, if the jurist, if Islamic sharia is referring us to customs, that is exactly the definition of secular rule. You know, and I'm going to come back to, I'm not uh, uh, being a little bit dream over here. I know that also, as much as there's secular values in Islam, there are unsecular values in Islam. But I'm emphasizing right now the secular values in Islam, and I'll say why. So, Shura, the principle of consultation itself is a secular value that you just consult with the experts of society. The, the uh, idea of no compulsion in religion, like Rahaf uh, Adina, as you know, I've spoken before about people who think that this is, have been abrogated, this has been nusikhat with the war verses, and some that think that, uh, that this verse is a leading verse, a dominant verse over all other verses. And uh, of course, we like that interpretation better. And if it's a leading, if it's a, if it's a principle, then this is a secular principle that there is no compulsion in religion. The constitution that was written, this is a, an actual uh, photo of it. The constitution that was written, some claim that it's the first constitution written, uh, that was written in Medina when the, when, the, when the Prophet migrated from Mecca to Medina, the first thing he did, he, he wrote a constitution, kind of an agreement between him and the residents of the city, uh, which were the Jews, uh, mostly Jews at that time, there were no Christians in Medina, but Jews and non-Muslims. So he wrote a treaty a kind of an agreement that became kind of the constitution. If you refer back to that constitution, it's kind of lengthy and detailed, but if you, if you go back to it, I read it, although there's a lot of the religious references in it, he refers to the Muslims as believers. So he refers, thank you, actually, listen, I'm going to try to finish. So he, uh, there is a reference that he refers to Muslims as believers. And some consider it, and I agree with that, I consider it a secular document. The Prophet did not really bring in Islam in this document. It was a secular, secular document. Also, there is a Prophet uh, versus statements. One of the, our biggest problems uh, in Islam is that we mix between the two. When is he a statesman? When is he a Prophet? When is he just a regular uh, man? And we, we mix between these two. Even the Sahaba were mixed. Even the Sahaba used to mix between that. In the Battle of Badr, he went and he camped in a certain place. Uh, al khabab al-Ard came, visited him and told him, Oh Prophet, uh, did you pick this place or is it kind of from God? He said, no, it's from me. Innama ra'i wal mashur. It is from me and I'm open to your opinions. He said, I think it's the wrong location. I think we should, we should move to where the uh, wells of Badr are. So we have control over the water. And the Prophet ordered everyone to move to that. That, that decision was better than his decision. Um, and many, the digging of the trench, they are completely confused what to do uh, at the Battle of the Trench. And obviously from the name, uh, he, uh, Salman the Pharisee, who is a, a Muslim from Persia, uh, he told them, you know, we, we have this method in Persia that we use, that we dig trenches. So he was clueless about, you know, the solution. And he consulted, and uh, the solution came from Salman. Failing, uh, falling, the ambush, and there's other examples, I'm gonna save time. Planting of the trees is a very famous example. Who knows this example? Where a person came, consulted with him about planting trees, and the Prophet gave him the opinion, and the whole uh, season uh, well, did not grow. It was, a, it was a, uh, the, the, all, the, all the plants didn't grow, and it was a, a poor, a consultation from the Prophet, and then when they went back to him, he told him, You know better about these things, I don't know. So he, he established that, you know, you know that, that you, you don't refer back to religion in all these cases. This is a secular value in Islam. Revolts against corruption. The Prophets mentioned in the Quran, they're mentioned as revolting against certain corruptions in society. 
So when Moses is mentioned, this is the, op the oppression of Pharaoh is mentioned. When Shu'aib is mentioned, this corruption in the market, mutaffifin. When Jesus is mentioned, it's the corruption in the religious institution and the hypocrisy in the religious institution. And when, when you read the Quran in Mecca, it talks about the, the burial of the girls at birth. It talks about the oppression to the orphan. It talks about uh, you know uh, different types of corruption in society, which means that uh, there is uh, you know there is a concept of you can interpret the message messages of the prophets as a, a revolution against corruption in society rather than an enforcement of this of religious rule can be interpreted as, uh, such as that. And then the, the last point is moral, moral relativism. A lot of example. Um, it's, it's, Islam presents moral relativism. Teach your kids your values for they are created for a time other than your time. This is secular value. Al-Khimar fi ahkam al-Hudud. When uh, jurists come to the Hudud, cutting the hand and stoning the... They, there is no country that's practicing that other than ISIS and Saudi Arabia. And the majority of the Muslim world, you know that Saudi Arabia is like, what, 16 million? It's a fraction, small fraction of the Islamic world. But the, uh, most of the Islamic countries who claim that the Quran is part of their... By the way, most of the Islamic countries, they claim that the Quran is part of their constitution, that their constitution is inspired by parts of Sharia. So uh, uh, they actually do not practice these ahkam, which means that uh, there is, uh, they take, they, they reinterpret it and they use other ahkam. Okay, we are out of time, but there are many examples of moral relativism. The reason, uh, the most important, this is the conclusion, the most important uh, uh, conclusion of this talk. So we have secular values in Islam, and I know that I can stand here again for another hour and speak about unsecular values, right? How Islam defeats secularism, how Islam involves church and state, mosque and state. But what is the point then of mentioning the secular values in Islam? I think the only methodology today for Islamic reform, and we're not talking about Islamic reform here, but we're cultivating the discussion in general about everything that has to do with uh, us being, you know, related and connected to Islam, whether culturally or religiously. Selectiveness is the main methodology of Islamic reform. We Muslims, if they are not going to understand that the only way to move forward is to select very, I'm saying it very directly, to be selective, that, okay, this is the anthology that we have inherited, we have to be selective. That's your best option for the survivor of Islam is for selection. So, uh, I'm gonna just finish with that. Uh, we, we do have uh, a movement in Islam also that is trying to do that. It is also taboo uh, subject. It is also, it has a fight in front of the rigidity of the test and the divinity of the test, the text. So, uh, uh, till, and, and these conversations, they, uh, they uh, facilitate that. And I tell, uh, you know, this is a very important message that if we do not cultivate and facilitate such discussions, this is the biggest disfavor to Islam and it is the best tools for Islamophobia and for the misinterpretation of, uh, to, you know, mistreatment of Muslims as people. I think Muslimish, you know, uh, just like what happened to uh, uh, secular Judaism, which we are in the center, uh, that was established by secular uh, Jews, and, and it's very interesting because we have a very similar religions. Uh, Muslims are gonna end up with uh, having uh, that uh, that choice of, of you know of whatever your belief is, you are still identified as a Muslim. So Muslim became people rather than a system of faith or philosophy. And when this happens, it's important to be clear, to have the freedom and the diversity and enough colors to paint your own personality and, and, and character and uh, identity. The word identity is the main word in this conference. Uh, to move forward and not to be struck with people who want one color to be 
just like the rigidity of the te text. And that is our challenge, and this is our uh, method of dealing with this challenge. Thank you very much.